Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to have everybody here. Uh, I'm Murray. I'm Murray D. Allen, the Dean of the Merrick School of uh, Business. And, and this is an event that uh, we look forward to uh, every year. It's, uh, it's very important to us. And you know, some people ask, you know, why is it that we're running an entrepreneurship competition? And it's, there's two simple reasons. Entrepreneurship is in our blood, you know, because at UBE we were funded by entrepreneurs. And uh, so it's in our blood. And uh, the second is, is that, you know, we provide practical, career-focused uh, education. And there's no better way than learning about business than actually trying to do it. And so that's why our student entrepreneurs are, are, are here. Um, I just, my, my job here really is to welcome everyone. Uh, we've got many friends here uh, from the entrepreneurship community in Baltimore, students, uh, faculty, uh, and also we're live streaming this uh, around the world at the moment, so we, we welcome uh, our friends from, from, from around the world. Uh, I want to introduce our, our president who, who's going to uh, kick this off, uh, President Kurt Schmolk, so thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean D.L. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to see you. As uh, Murray mentioned, uh, the University of Baltimore was founded by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. It was actually, back in 1925, it was a merger of a night law school and a night business school, and we've been focused particularly on education for adult uh, learners uh, for so many years, and we're very proud of the fact that we're among the uh, best in the nation in serving uh, that uh, population. This particular uh, event is the uh, Leonard and Phyllis Atman competi competition. It's uh, a great competitive business prize, and certainly um, as an initial matter, we'd like to greet Leonard and Phyllis Atman, who are here. Thank you very much for being here. Not only are they uh, the sponsors of this uh, competitive prize, but uh, I know Leonard in particular took time from his very busy schedule to come out and meet with the finalists uh, in this program, told them a little bit about uh, his story, and I think really inspired them. And uh, they're going to com compete tonight, and then one day they're going to try to compete against you, Leonard. That'll be... Uh, <laughs> Compete against your kids, uh, okay, real good. I would like to also uh, note that this uh, competition has been very successful in moving our students from uh, being students to being successful entrepreneurs. Uh, and take, for example, uh, Shelly Blondell. Now, Shelly is over here. Shelly was our winner last year. Uh, thank you very much. With the seed money that she won, Shelby was able to transform her idea for a three-in-one crab mallet knife bottle opener into a business, and it's called The Sheller. In the past year, with the help from her earnings here, she's gone into production and sold about 1,000 shellers, providing enough revenue to invest back into the company for expansion, including adding a second model directed at restaurants. So we, everybody, go buy a sheller. Uh, the, uh... And whether you know it or not, uh, Shelly, uh, you're part of a, a larger trend. According to the National Women's Business Council, there are about 10 million women-owned businesses in the United States, an increase of more than 2 million in companies in just over uh, 10 years. Women-owned businesses are now generating more than a trillion dollars in the U.S. economy, and that number is on the rise. And I can tell you one of the reasons we, we had, um, in addition to um, uh, Murray Diel, our former uh, dean of uh, the business school, now our provost, uh, Dr. Darlene Smith, is over here really encouraging women entrepreneurs, and we thank her very much for the work that, that she's uh, done. So in any event, uh, I want to thank you all. We're going to get on uh, with the um, competition, but at this point, it's really my pleasure to introduce a man who has been very involved not only in business and entrepreneurship, but in public policy, uh, helping so many ways to encourage education uh, throughout uh, this state, uh, Mr. Leonard Atman. If I 
Thank you, Mr. President. Very good. What a delightful pleasure it is to be here again this year and share this wonderful idea that my wife and I put together several years ago. Um, my wife, among others, has had several businesses that have been extremely successful as a small business start from a zero idea to very successful ideas and running and controlling and doing all by herself, some with other partners, some with her children, three fabulous businesses in the Baltimore metropolitan area. She's since retired. She says she's not tired, but she was tired for her to move on and try to spend some time with her, with her families and, uh, and sort of travel a little bit with us all as well. So um, it can be done. Uh, I've seen it uh, from what it is that I was able to get started with through the help of my father and uh, starting in the deli and working down there and going all the way through when I married, was lucky enough to marry my wife and her father was in the real estate development business and I began to work there not knowing anything about real estate, banking, uh, being a um, geologist, uh, or anything else that had to do with building or development. And so uh, I started long ago, way back then. As a matter of fact, when we started building apartments, there was a young lady here who was just introduced before that was working with us that I got to know later when I came back to the University of Baltimore, and that's the, the dean, Darlene Smith, who is your business, uh, uh, in here as well. So Darlene, thank you very much for starting with us, and it was great to see you be a fabulous educator back here at University of Baltimore. Um, uh, Henry Mortimer, thank you very much for putting all this together with Murray Dalzell. And um, one other uh, judge that was supposed to be here with us tonight was out doing some things that were very important in expanding our family. She gave birth to a wonderful young son <laughs> just this week. So as great-grandparents, Phyllis and I are very happy to announce that to you, but she said that uh, she's probably watching the streaming as well to see what was going on here tonight and making room for her son to come here to University of Baltimore. So at any rate, At any rate, I want to thank all of the judges, the coaches, and all of the people that worked hard with the other 26 that applied for participating for here for tonight. And uh, I was lucky enough to spend some time with all of the uh, presenters here today, and I can tell you they are all energetic, they all have wonderful ideas, and we can do our best by encouraging them for each and one of their ideas. Thank you for being here. Thank you for participating in the prize. And thanks to the University of Baltimore. Thank you, Mr. Atman. Good evening, everyone. So tonight is going to be a, a audience participation and courage kind of a night. So when we say good evening or when we bring our contestants out, I'd like to practice getting a round of applause. So good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. And thank you and welcome to the sixth annual Leonard, At Leonard and Phyllis Atman Business Prize competition. I'm Henry Mortimer. I'm director of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And uh, before we get going, I just want to take a couple of minutes uh, to first, before we introduce our judges and competitors, I want to say a few minutes, say a few words about the center, which we are, as we call it, the front door for entrepreneurship in Baltimore. In 2016, the CEI uh, celebrated 10 years of encouraging and supporting entrepreneurship and learning among UB students and alumni and faculty and staff. Our ongoing goal is to help students and others launch and grow business ventures while providing opportunities to educate, engage, and collaborate with the Baltimore business community, which is really why we are here tonight. Uh, the types of students that we attract are, first and foremost, we have our entrepreneurship fellows. Uh, they're select students that uh, 
uh, come in, uh, uh, apply in with a business idea, and then spend two years in the classroom and in the center uh, as an incubator, nurturing and, we hope, launching a business when they graduate. Uh, we also attract students who are studying entrepreneurship, some of whom are probably here tonight. They may have their own businesses, are considering entrepreneurship as a career, or perhaps are taking classes here at the university. And we also welcome alumni looking for at least five years back, uh, they are encouraged to come and take, uh, partake in our programs, our initial counseling, physical space, and uh, the ability to set up a new business with us. So our main goal is to provide emerging entrepreneurs with access to the business, Baltimore business community, as I mentioned. We have partnerships with numerous local organizations and companies, including Startup Maryland, the ETC, Betamore, MICA, Coppin, Morgan, and Towson Universities. And then our entrepreneurship and residence taps tap into the local expertise of volunteers in their fields. Uh, we have folks from SCORE, the Baltimore Small Business Resource Center, as well as uh, specialty professor or specialist professionals in legal, accounting, HR, marketing, et cetera, who come in and spend many, many hours volunteering their time to work with our students. So we also offer workshops and seminars and several business pitch competitions throughout the year, including tonight. We do this again in the spring. And all of this is available to all uh, students and everyone on campus at the University of Baltimore and available for free. And we are housed right next door. So that's a list of some of the, uh, the folks that we work with, some of whom are here tonight. Uh, next door, we have in our physical space, we have uh, set up a sort of a collaborative incubator, co-working space similar to what you might find at the ETC. Uh, we also offer 3D printer, um, which is supported by UB Center for Digital Communication, Commerce, and Culture and a digital recording studio downstairs for commercial grade video production. Our goal really is to serve as a bridge from the classroom to help students gain real world practical experience and to advance their careers. And I invite you to come by for a visit anytime. Now, on with the competition. But I wanna take one quick moment to thank the many volunteers who tireless whose tireless efforts have made this evening possible including the first round judges and coaches and mentors who are listed on the back of your program, as well as the army of students who help me manage the center for, on a weekly basis on top of all the other things they do, including working full time likely, taking a full load of classes, et cetera. Next, I'd like to thank and introduce our judges for tonight's competition. Uh, Wendy Levitas, so you raise your hand when I call your name. Wendy Levitas, Executive Vice President at Atman Properties. So Re Rebecca, is, is at home, as we just found out, with, a, with a new, the newest Atman clan member, Rebecca Steller, Director of Marketing Advertisement at a g Management Company. Jonathan Atman, Director of Acquisitions and Development at Atman Holdings. Harris Levitas, TPC Racing. And then joining us on this side, Laura Newman, an entrepreneur and former Anne Arundel County Executive. Angela Singleton, the pre, who runs the Pre-Seed Fund at TEDCO and Deb Tillett, President and Executive Director for the Emerging Technology Centers. <clears throat> and our honorary judges, last but certainly not least, Leonard Atman, who's Chairman of the Board, Atman Properties, and Phyllis Atman, President of Phyllis L. and Leonard J. Atman Foundation. Exactly. <laughs> the rules of the competition are simple. Each of the six finalists will have five minutes to present their, to pitch their businesses to you all and to this panel of judges. <clears throat> and, the, and they are listed, they'll be coming in the order they're listed in the program. Uh, and the judges then have a combined five minutes to ask questions, so around 10 minutes per participant. I'll keep time and I'll let, let everyone know when there's a minute remaining. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, audience members, you do play a part here. Uh, we encourage you to cheer on the contestants, like I mentioned. We'll try that again, right? And we do want you to cheer loudly because we're out on the internet, the World Wide Web there. Um, although I, I do ask if you refrain from clapping or cheering during a presentation. Um, and then don't forget to vote for your favorite contestant using the ballot uh, inside your program. That is the third prize for this evening. One more acknowledgement speaking of prize money, that I want to make before we begin. I'd like to invite Jason Tagler to come up here and deliver the first prize of the evening, the Pitch Creator Hustle Award. I'll let Jason describe what that is. Thank you. 
Good evening. This is a wonderful event. It's great to be here. I'm really excited. Thank you. Um, so my name is Jason Tagler. My day job is I'm a growth equity investor at Camden Partners, and my volunteer passion project is Pitch Creator. I founded it in 2014 with the goal of helping to create jobs in the Baltimore area by teaching entrepreneurs how to communicate with investors and lenders and raise capital for their businesses. And we were really thrilled to work with Henry and the team here at UB's Entrepreneurship Center this year to help the six finalists prepare for this competition. And the way we did that is we have an online course and we wrapped around that online course some custom coaching. So Calvin Young, who works with me, worked one-on-one -on -one with all the finalists. And uh, Calvin couldn't be here today, so he's sorry he couldn't <laughs> join. But you know, as we all know, uh, grit, persistence, and hustle are really important parts of entrepreneurship. And we wanted to just, in our way, from the pitch creator team side, you know, recognize and celebrate the entrepreneur finalists who work the hardest during the coaching process and the preparation process and made the most progress. So we call that the Hustle 500 Award. It's in the form of $500 in this jar. <laughs> and this is, unlike Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, this is accepted at all Baltimore establishments. <laughs> And hopefully it will get used uh, for celebrating and potentially putting back into the business, but we hope celebrating. So without further ado, Calvin, who did all the coaching, uh, chose the finalist or the, the person who's going to win this award, and I don't even know who it is. So we're going to open it up and find out. And the winner of the Hustle 500 award is Crystal Santafo. <laughs> not here. <laughs> she's hustling. She's, out there. she's hustling. She's practicing. Okay. So Jason and Calvin spent hours and hours with these folks. Uh, really, and, and the, the basis for the award was? The, uh, the entrepreneur who worked the hardest and made the most progress. Because we... Yeah, we have learning objectives, and uh, we actually measured uh, each entrepreneur, Calvin measured each entrepreneur as they improved against those learning objectives through the coaching program. And we thought it was important because some of these students actually have businesses, and others are starting from scratch with an idea. So some of them have a little bit of an advantage in that they've already got a business up and running. So, okay, well, we, we've, we don't want to hold up the show, so we have it here, it and we can, we can give it to her later. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. All right. Well, <laughs> here she comes. Yeah! There we go. <laughs> All right. So without further ado, on with the show. Uh, is everybody ready? Was that exciting? Was that fun? We're giving out money tonight, people. And she earned it. She earned it. So our first uh, finalist is Brianna Billups, who will be presenting Fully Grown. Brianna? Come on out, Brianna. <laughs> Round of applause. Thank you. All right, you have five minutes. Hi, everybody. My name is Brianna Billups, and this is my story. I was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, where I spent the majority of my professional career cooking in various restaurants and teaching essential healthy eating lessons in city schools. From the first time I saw Rachel Ray on the Food Network channel, 11-year-old me knew I wanted to be a chef. I even remember hosting my own cooking shows with my childhood teddy bears in the studio audience. True story. When I was 19, I piloted the Sweet Green in Schools program that educated students about healthy eating and sustainability in Baltimore. 
The idea for Fully Grown came about during my first assignment in culinary school, which led me to discovering that I had lived in a food desert my entire life. As you may know, food deserts drive disparities in health, education, and economics. Learning these negative impacts of food deserts challenged me to find ways to improve my community. My time here at UB has inspired me to find a way that business can be a part of the solution, which leads me to my company's mission, to grow our communities the way we grow our food, fully and sustainably. I'm so sorry, it's gonna come. For many busy individuals and families, they have a hard time making healthy eating choices. Myself included. We often have a hard time finding healthy food options locally. We lack the knowledge of how to prepare fresh food options and simply lack the time to cook. Fully Grown offers a three-pronged solution. The first, we offer fully prepared meals at an affordable price to fit the customer's everyday needs while also giving them the power to make healthier food choices. The second, we offer seasonally, seasonal fruit-based snacks made from 100% all natural ingredients. And lastly, we increase awareness by donating a percentage of our proceeds to our nonprofit arm, The Garden Project, which supports urban agriculture programs in city schools. As you can see, Fully Grown offers a complete solution to the problem. Our revenue model is simple. We make our money through the sales of our products, wholesome meals, and healthy snacks. An average meal costs the customer $7, and our fruit roll-ups are sold $1 per roll wholesale. Fully grown currently, sorry. This year so far, we've made $14,000, and we anticipate that number growing to $50,000 by next year. The size of our opportunity can be broken down into three phases. Phase one is focused on the local Baltimore metropolitan area. Phase two is focused on the mid-Atlantic region. And phase three is focused on growing our company nationally. Fully Grown currently has two subsets of existing customers. Retail locations including Dovecote Cafe and OK Natural, and the 27 recurring customers who on average purchase four lunches and two dinners on a weekly basis. We are currently working to have our products placed in Prime Corner Grocery Store, Eddie's Markets, local Whole Foods Market Stores, and nine other retail locations. Our indirect competitors are prepared delivered meals, Blue Apron and other meal kit delivery services, and free snack brands such as Annie's. But in reality, our direct competitors are the 867 fast food chains and corner stores located in Baltimore City alone. Our advantage over the competition is that our meals are affordable, made from fresh ingredients, delivered to the customer to enjoy by simply reheating, our free snacks utilize seasonal flavors, and we uniquely have direct buy-in from our customers as we are engaged in the same communities as they live, work, and play. Since our last round of funding, we have achieved the following milestones. We have secured commercial kitchen space at City Seeds. We have rebranded our meal pack packaging to feature 100% compostable packaging. We've partnered with DoorDash Drive to facilitate our delivery growth as we scale. And lastly, I am the proud recipient of the first Better Business Bureau Spark Award, which acknowledges young companies for their dedication towards culture, community, and character. If selected as the winner of this competition, we plan to use the funds in the following ways. $3,000 to research an app to continue to make on mobile ordering easy for our customers for meal prep, as well as social media marketing campaigns to grow our local brand awareness, and an additional $3,000 to secure a co-packer for our fruit snacks, as well as shelf-stable packaging. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your support. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Brianna. So as you can see, uh, this isn't easy, and it's certainly not fun going first. <laughs> no, I think that I was just because your last name is B. Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's How okay. did she do, everyone? <laughs> yeah. Right. This is not easy. And you have lots of, lots of food samples for the audience I afterwards, do. right? Please? To make up for, yes. yeah, yeah, to anything. cover it all over, okay. Please visit my table. We'll have a great salad and fruit snacks. Great. Thank you. Thank Judges, you. do we have any questions Ooh. for Brianna? Anyone first? Okay, we'll start here. Where do you prepare the food? At our commercial kitchen, City Seeds. And where is that? It is in the city, East Baltimore, 1412 North Wall Street. And how large is it? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. <laughs> like how? A little small warehouse. Um, no, so it's through the partnership of um, School of Food. And they have a teaching, kiss, a teaching kitchen there where they do their cooking classes. Um, and they started an entrepreneurship and residence program, and we're the first and there. How many people work for you? It's just me and my co founder today. Oh, okay. <laughs> and how many meals can you get out a day? A day? Um, so on average, we make about 500 meals per month because we're only in the kitchen one day a week. Okay, thank you. you. Hi, Dan. Hi, you covered a whole lot and it was terrific. I really appreciate it. The one thing though, you mentioned social media, but how do you find your customers? What are you doing really in terms of marketing? So if I wanted to find out about you, how would I? So currently we haven't taken any steps to do any traditional marketing. All of our customers have came to us through word of mouth. Um, but we do have an Instagram page currently where we do promote fully grown meal prep. Hi, um, terrific job. I know it's hard to do this. You are very brave. Thank you. Very prepared. Um, I'm, where I'm struggling is I'm having a disconnect between the prepackaged meal and the food desert concept. Okay. You know, I grew up in a food desert in East Baltimore, and we went to the corner store and bought pre packaged food, like tasty cakes. Right. <laughs> and so that was a real desert. There was, you know, we. We bought produce off of a horse-drawn carriage called an A-Rabber. That, to me, was a food desert. And you're talking about uh, your competition being Blue Apron and Whole Foods. So help me make the connection there. Who is your target audience, and how are you directly serving them? OK. Um, so I would say that our direct competitors are those corner stores who only feature processed foods and tasty cakes. Um, but in people's minds, the first thing they think of is Blue Cake when I mention a packaged meal. Um, so as far as the food as it goes, our competitors are the corner stores, and we want to be able to bring a healthy meal that's already prepared, that takes the thought out of what's for dinner, um, and allows customers to make a healthier choice without having to think about it. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, so let me just um, take it a little bit further. So your price point is $7 for a meal, for a meal. Mm -hmm. um, which could be pretty expensive if you have four or five people in a family. That would be a fairly expensive per person. Is it $7 per person? And secondly, are you able to get it to those locations? Are you servicing the corner stores? Are, are you able to deliver to those locations to serve the audience? So we do have delivery. Yes, yeah, so we deliver straight to your door right now. Hi, Brianna. That was Hi. a great presentation. Thank you. And the foodie in me has the question, how far does DoorDash deliver? <laughs> Apparently, so, we have a 10-mile radius from our commercial kitchen. Okay. And consistent with the question you just had, I just want to make sure I understand, too, mm -hmm. that your target market overlaps with your existing customer base. Are you finding that, that at $7 a, a meal, you're able to service the desired customer base? Or is your customer base a little broader than you thought? I would say our customer base is pretty broad. OK, so now I think I'm finally understanding your question. Um, so food deserts don't only exist in the city, um, as well as people who prior li who have previously lived in a food desert. So do you currently still live in a food desert today? Fortunately, no. <laughs> no, right? So we have people who have previously lived in food deserts. They move away, but they take those same habits with them. So to answer your question as well, our base is broader. So I think the furthest customer we have is probably Hartford County. And while he still has the habits of living in a food desert and not being able to make healthy choices, fully grown meal prep supplies him with that. But we also do have people who still live in the city and in food deserts in it. Because if you think about it, they're spending the money anyway. So you're still going to the corner store and probably spending 10 times the money you would spend on a healthier meal on processed foods. So, okay, hope that answers the question. Thank you. Any more questions for Brianna, judges? 
No. All right. All good. Great. Thank you, Thank you Brianna. <laughs> All right. So next up, we have Willow Hendershot, who will be pitching Prevail. So how many of you play or at least know someone that plays video games? How many of you have or know someone that has a mental illness? Those questions might seem like miles apart, but I'm willing, that some, I'm willing to bet some of you thought of the same person when you answered those questions. I know that because I'm one of those people. My name is Willow Hendershot, and I've been living with depression and an anxiety disorder for many years now. Growing up, I was afraid of meeting new people and going outside, so instead I, say, I stayed inside and played games. And through going on adventures and fighting evil from the safety of my couch, it made me a little less afraid of the outside world. But I'm not the only one dealing with those sort of problems. According to NAMI, one in five people in America suffer from some sort of mental illness. It costs the US economy about $193 billion each year in lost earnings due to mental illness conditions in the workplace. And suicide is the second leading cause of death in ages 10 to 34. On top of that, last year, nearly 60% of those people with mental illnesses did not seek any sort of treatment. This is usually due to cost or a general inaccessibility. And I wanna do something about that. So I started working on a computer game called Prevail. It's a 2D platformer, like Mario if you're not as familiar, where you play someone dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. And as you solve puzzles and make choices in the game, it reflects how the character is dealing with their PTSD and how they prevail. This is a way for people to see the real symptoms of this illness and to hopefully resonate with people that are going through it currently. And there's a lot of people that this can reach. Worldwide, over two billion people play video games. Of those, about 60% play on computers. If we divide that by five, with the one in five from earlier, it gives you a target market of about 200 million people that, I'm, that I can potentially reach. So by, by the first year of release, I'm hoping to get at least 500 to 1,000 copies bought. This is mostly gonna be done through Steam. It's the world's largest online gaming distribution platform. In the future, I'd like to also expand that into PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo platforms. And I'd also like to reach out to crisis intervention centers and inpatient therapy facilities to see if those patients could benefit from playing the game. And it's all just to reach that target market of ages 15 to 34 who either have a mental illness or who don't but want to learn more. So obviously, I would like to sell on my own website too, but in selling through Steam, even though I will only get 70% of the profits, it'll still, I'll still be making uh, almost double what I would normally make if I just published it on my own. My main competition is gonna be other independent games. They cover a very wide range of topics, but most only cover mental illness from a personal standpoint, rather than with the inclusive educational aspect I'm trying to. There's also AAA games, which are your high-end, very massive production. Um, but those typically don't talk about these sorts of sensitive issues because it's just too much of a risk with their multi-million dollar budgets. There have also been some psychologists and psychiatrists that have commissioned games from small development teams, but these are also usually expensive and they only reach a very small target of that doctor's patients. Prevail is something different. It's, it's meant to give a sense of solidarity to those people that are dealing with this problem that might not that might not have any other support system. So besides having lived through this, uh, I have a degree in game design. Uh, I started working on Prevail in 2015 while I was getting my degree. When I was working on it in class, it was voted the best indie game within my grade. Um, when I came to UBALT, I also applied for both the Wilson Presidential Scholarship and the Entrepreneurship Fellows Program. In both applications, I included my work on Prevail, and it was the primary reason that I was awarded both of these scholarships. 
So I'd like to have a demo released by late next year after I've, developed, after I've got my own website up. After that, I'm going to need to start building another team, especially a programmer, in order to start working on the full release of the game. With this round of funding, most of it would be going towards a new computer so that I have the hardware and software needed to work on this demo. Any extra money is going to be going towards more research and other software and external, um, external tools for developing that demo. So that hopefully we can start, I can start figuring out how people will prevail in 2019. Thank you. Hold on to that. Great job, Willow. Oh, oh no. Does anybody, okay. any of the judges, any judges have any questions for Willow? This is not a question, but um, look into a company called Brinkbit. Re do you know them? I have actually spoken with Evan Fuller. He uh -huh. mentioned that he mentioned that he was going to connect me with um, the rest of the studio. I can do that for you. Evan's moved on to Mosaic, which is also <laughs> games and learning. But um, yeah, Brian Bamford is Brinkbit, and you design, publish, and you know, sell right on their own platform. So yeah. great. Thank you. So is the goal a really terrific job, by the way? And kudos to you for you know, tackling such an important subject. Is the goal to bring awareness or to help those with mental illness better uh, deal with it? So it's meant to do both. The primary audience is going to be people that are currently suffering from mental illness, but it's also, an, you know, anybody can play this game um, if it can also educate people who aren't as familiar with, this sort, with these symptoms, then that's all the better. Thank you. So Willow, what a great vision you have, and I know you will prevail. Um, the great name, yes. Thank you. What analytics are you going to apply to know the effectiveness of your tool in solving the problem? So the game has multiple endings in it. The different choices that you make throughout the game determine which of the multiple endings you will get. And I'm going to have I'm going to have analytics that sort of figure out how many people reach what endings to get a better sense of the general the general uh, player base and how they, uh, the different ways that they look at the problems throughout the game. Other, other questions from the judges? Yeah, one. one more? I'm not coming up with, it, with, with the questions, but I have one more suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, University of Maryland Systems MIPS partnerships, they'd be a great opportunity for you to potentially get the research done by one of the University of Maryland Systems schools and paid for. That's awesome, thank MIPS. you. So how will you market the game? How will people know what it is? And most people with mental illness don't really realize they have it as well. Most of the marketing will, be prob will probably be done through Steam. Um, they do a lot to sort of, they do a lot to bolster um, the different indie communities and the small, uh, even individual developers. Um, I'll also be trying to market it through my own website and also there are several people on YouTube um, that play video games on there that have already expressed interest in playing the game for their, for their channel. That it? No more questions, judges? Great. All right. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you all, but we're only two people into this, and I'm already having a hard time figuring out who's... Who's my favorite? So next up, we have Karima McClendon, who will be presenting Karima McClendon Bridal Fashions. Let's give a round of applause for Karima and her, her prop, which I can see coming out right now. Do we sing, Here Comes the Bride? Here Comes the Bride. Wow. Karima McClendon, everyone. Hi, everyone. 
How are you? Okay. I'm fine. I actually want to tell you a story about the time that I got married. And I was so excited. I'm going to be a bride. I was 31 years old at the time. And I decided, you know, I know I'd worked in the industry as a gown designer, but I'm planning a wedding long distance. I can't be bothered with this. So I went gown shopping. And it was a disaster. Every style was the corset style. And I'm thinking, my 90-year-old grandmother-in-law-to-be is going to be sitting right there. I cannot have cleavage up to here and my back out. And so this became a problem, because every store that I went to only seemed to have these styles for younger brides. And that happened in 2005. It's still happening now. That the problem is that there seems to be not enough gowns for brides that are between the ages of 30 and 55 years old. And so that problem becomes that brides like me either have to go shop from place to place and settle on a gown that's inappropriate, settle on a gown that's the cost of a small car, or have your gown made like I did. Now, luckily, I knew how to source, and I knew how to go and get the best prices, and I knew who I could trust to make my gown. But not every bride can do that. And so that's where my company comes in. Um, Karima McLinden Bridal aims to solve the problem that stores have of having this, this spot um, where brides cannot find a gown that's suitable for them. And what we can do is supply stores with this gown. Um, we use designs that are um, sophisticated but not dowdy. We use silks, uh, French lace, and we can supply these gowns in a price point between $2,500 and $6,500 retail. So our pricing model, our revenue model, is twofold. One, uh, revenue comes from the actual stores buying the samples, the gowns that you see normally hanging in a bridal shop when you go in. Um, and on top of that, and we figured we can sell three per season or six per year per store. On top of that, when the stores generate more sales through those samples, that's more revenue for us. And so total, we figured that we can generate per store $101,500. And when you take away our expenses for manufacturing the gowns, marketing, so on and so forth, that we can net $49,300 per store. Now, what's important about this is that in the United States, bridal company, this is a $3 billion industry. Even with us getting 1% of the industry, of the market, that we, would, we could create um, 15 jobs for stitchers. These are jobs that are here in Baltimore because the, the, the gowns would be manufactured in Baltimore. And that we can, also, um, we can also have these as skilled full-time jobs with a livable wage. And so our plan is to roll out between now and February of 2019 working on our first collection of gowns. Uh, uh, April of 2019 is considered the national open to buy for stores, but we would only target the mid-Atlantic region and call it a soft rollout. In October of 2019, that's when we plan on rolling out the stores, rolling out to stores nationally and selling our gowns nationally. Now, I have some competition, of course, um, but what I do better than my com competition is that I can deliver gowns because they're made here in Baltimore within eight weeks, as opposed to my next competitor, Amsala, who has to spend 12 weeks or more manufacturing a gown, or even uh, Berta, who her gowns are coming literally from a slow boat coming from China. It's six months. So um, uh, what I plan to do uh, with the, the funds should I win this competition is use $1,000 to help uh, finish this first collection. Um, another $1,000 for a used dress form, much like the one that you see here, she's a plus size dress form, so that I can actually offer gowns and larger sizes so that I can fit all brides. And, also, and then $1,000 would go towards working capital to, to hire stitchers to help with this um, collection and going forward. 
So my experience, I have over 20 years experience in the bridal and fashion industry. I've worked um, notably for Arnold Scazzi, Bride, and for um, uh, Eva Forsyth, Cynthia C. and Company, and I also consulted with a company called Nikki Versace Lingerie that was based in the United Kingdom. Um, that's everything. If you have any questions, I feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. Do you make the gowns? Yes. And you have a group of people that help you make them? Right now, I do, I do not. I am searching for, for um, um, stitchers. And so I'm actually going to be working out of open works with the hopes of collaborating with other stitchers so that we can get the process of sewing faster. Because I sew pretty fast, but it's just me right now. And so that's part of what I'm looking for is right, other and people. How will you, now, are you going to put them into stores? Into stores, yes. And the stores will let you put them in there? Um, I'm selling to them wholesale, yes. OK. Yes. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Any? Oh, I can pass it. Hi. That was great. Great idea. Thank um, you. I've had to make that choice a couple times. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, just a couple times. So I get it. I hear you. Um, my, my question is, and I don't think you went over it, you said you will be in stores, yes. but um, I thought there was a lot of rental stuff going on in bridal gowns. Is there? Am no. I? I'm no. that old. No. So there's no rental in bridal gowns. The problem is because we have so many curves um, that when you fit a gown to, say, me, that's it. Okay. Like, you'd have to find someone else who's five feet tall and built like this. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> okay. It was something I didn't see, and obviously I don't have the domain expertise except to do it. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Thank you for sharing that. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Um, I particularly enjoyed mature aesthetic because that was my category when I was shopping for a gown. Um, I didn't really define it that way at the time, but uh, I like it. This is my question. Have you sketched out your first collection? And yes. you know, for those of us who are a mature aesthetic, there are certain things that we're always looking for that are difficult to find in a gown. Yes. The arms, the waist. We want something that's comfortable, yes. but at the same time feminine and flattering. So yes. I'd be curious to know if you've already given some thought to what the first collection will look like. Yes, absolutely. So this neckline that you see on this dress, this is like the most flattering neckline for all women. It doesn't matter what your weight is. I was heavier when I was married. That was the neckline that I wore because it was indeed the most flattering. And then also like a basque waist where it does this so it makes you look taller and slim in the front because when I designed initially for myself, it was, it was poof. And then when I tried on the, the first uh, sample, it was horrific. So I had to like slim, you know, build in, slim in the front and then have more of the drama in the, in the back. And so that's what I, for women who are built like me, you know, you can still have it slim in the front and then all of the drama in the back and it still be quite flattering. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? Any, any other questions? Sure. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, so I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned that um, the, the markets you're targeting is between, are women between the ages of 30 and 55? Yes. Do you know the actual size of that market and is it growing? That market is growing. So uh, the, the part of the problem with the industry is that um, when brides were first, you know, getting married and our sort of in our mind's eye of what we think of a bride was from 1960 when she was 20 years old. The average age of a bride getting married for the first time now is 31 years old. But the industry still designs for that prototypical 20-something year old bride. Um, and then in addition to that, 40% of that market is people who are getting married either for the first, uh, second time, one partner or both partners. And so this is a growing market, especially, yes. So it's huge, it's not a niche play here. No, yes. Interesting. Yes. Great, thank you. Great, any other Great. questions for Karima? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Do we have a name for your bridal gown model here? Oh. Sexy. Great. Thank you all. As you can see already tonight, we've got a wide range of business types here that we're producing at UB. And the whole goal, as I mentioned before, is connecting with the community. We've had great comments about who to go to next. Uh, so this has been very helpful. So next up, I'd like to welcome our award-winning hustler for the evening, Crystal Santafal, who will be presenting Crystal Tutu Paradise. Crystal. Hello, 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 everyone. How y'all doing? I love the response. Thank you so much. That'll make me feel better. Hey, family, that's pointing to me. Um, all right, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. All right, Crystal Tutu Paradise is a business that started solely because I wanted to give my niece, Crystal, a custom outfit for her birthday party. So the birthday party we planned it in August. We're like, we want to give her this big shebang. It was trolls. Um, she loves Poppy, she loves Branch. I had her sit there and tell me all the names of the people and she's like, yes, I love them, I love them. So I was like, okay, how can I make this into a custom outfit? Had no idea how to do tutus, no idea how to do t-shirts, though you can see my skill has improved. Thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you for the hand clap. Um, and so with this, I went to the store, got some ribbon, got some tool, which is this material right here, and hand tied it onto the ribbon. I had no Velcro, nothing to hold it together, and thus came this outfit. So she loved it. She was running around the party, and she was like, look at Poppy, look at my tutu. My mother couldn't stand it because the tool had a lot of glitter, so the glitter was all over the house by the end of the party. She forgave me for it, it was fine. Um, but my niece loved it so much, and just seeing her reaction made me see that I wanna do this for other people. Had no idea how I wanted to grow it, but I wanted to do it for more people. So, Serena Williams, she is breaking all barriers with a tutu. So you can't tell me that tutus are not happening in today's society. If Serena Williams can go to a tournament and kill it with a tutu, why can't she? You? you hear that? I, I, come on, y'all better clap for that. That was a good one. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. So the problem that Tutu Paradise is focusing on is people want to feel and look good for their birthday parties, graduation, all these different events. What is an event that is important to you throughout the year? Like what's that one day of the year you want to look dope from head to toe? Birthday. birthday. That was it? Y'all just care about birthday. Christmas? I was about to say, come on, we Thanksgiving, because we sit in the house with outfits on that looks cute. We all do it. Um, <laughs> and so what TT Paradise does is we want to be a one-stop shop. We, we are here to cater to your need regardless of the event. We've had people come and order tutus from us for Easter Sunday. So she went to church in a full-length tutu like I am the baddest thing in this church, praise the Lord. And so we were able to cater to that. She knew she wanted to look good on Easter Sunday, but she just didn't know what it was. And so that's when we came in and we gave her that one-stop shop for her and her daughter. And this is one of my first long-distance clients that I did in Kentucky when I first learned how to do a long tutu, and they loved it. It was amazing. I was, I was glad they liked it. So with our financials, it just, it just, it's clear that there's a market that we can tap into. There's people out there that are interested in buying tutus. At our price point, our base price point is $35 for a child tutu. So like an average child size, like right here. You want to stand up for me, Rosai? That's my little cousin, y'all. So an average child her size, their tutus start at 35, and adult tutus start at 50. And so with this, these numbers here, it just shows us that there are people out there that want to buy tutus. And I mean, and it can be for any big or small event. In our TAM, our low represents what I could do right now for a whole th year. I can do two, uh, two twos take up to two hours each, and that's what I can knock out in a year. But the high represents just the Baltimore numbers. So what I did was I went and I looked up the numbers for the women that are in Baltimore that have children under the ages of five that have birthday parties. And with that, I, that's when I got the 19,000 and I went on down and did all the math. So hopefully it pleases your wonderful eyes, all right? Okay, so 
Oh, and our uh, and one more, our audience that we're focusing on right now are mothers, a, ranging from the ages of 25 to 40, that want to get something for their daughters, their nieces, and even nephews. I also cater to boys as well. As you can see, that's an outfit that I did for my nephew's fourth birthday party. So we do boys, we do girls, we do men, we do everybody. We try to make sure we company everybody, but the main point tonight is the little girl tutus. Our secret sauce is that we care. We genuinely care that you want to look good. I will sit on the phone with my clients all day and all night if I have to, to make sure that they feel confident in their outfits. Because if you feel good, you act good. You just, like your whole attitude changes when you feel and look good. And so that's what our customers appreciate the most. We also offer flexible payment plans and we also have express ordering as well. I had one client, she texted me on Thursday night and said, I need a tutu Friday. Made it happen. That's something that a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of my competitors aren't able to do. And so with me being, even in Baltimore, I even let them know from the beginning, like, hey, this is gonna cost you extra for the shipping and for the process and everything, and they still are willing to pay that money. So that's something that lets me know that customers are willing to pay that money to look and feel good. And so with your investment, Crystal Tutu Paradise is a home-based business. So right now, we use home-based products to do our tutus. So there are times when I'm doing a custom shoe, and I may have a big iron in my hand holding the shoe. And that can be hazardous. I can burn my finger one day, something like that. We don't want to end up in a hospital. So what's happening is this investment is going to help us get the proper equipment we need to ensure safety reasons, and also to help us with our social media, stock inventory. One of the things I've learned since we've been open in this last year is that whenever I got an order, I had to go to pick up the supplies. But if we have stock inventory, that can cut down on our costs that we have to do every time we get a new order. And so that's one of the things that this investment will help us do. Excuse me. Also, the CTP Ambassador Program is something that I'm planning to implement in 2019. This program will help us bring on individuals to help the load. So it's not going to just be me hopefully in the next six months. We're gonna bring on a young fashion designer, AKA my sister. She's going to Baltimore City Community College and she wants to deal with fashion design. So why not bring her on to give her the skills that she may need to further herself in the fashion business. And I also have another individual who's gonna come and help me on the administrative side to help me keep up with the orders, to make sure I'm staying up to date with those because a one man show is just never gonna, it's, it's just not gonna end good. So why not take the time to invest in having other people come on the team and help me reach my goal? So, Crystal Tutu Paradise is here for you. Talk to the Tutu lady and let us spice up your life for any occasion you may need. Thank you. Well done, Crystal. Judges, do we have any questions? Like, what color is yours going to be, Deb? Yeah, what color? I got you. <laughs> So I think you addressed it a little bit at the end, mm -hmm. but this is all about you and it's your personality and your passion and making this happen. How is it scalable? How do you get to grow? So right now, so we're in the process of building our plan because that is something we do want to, we want to grow. Um, so that's where the ambassadors come in. That's when we want to build our social media presence because right now we're going against people that have been on social media for a while. So they have up over 2,000 people following their page. And so right now we're trying to build a clientele that will get us that wide range of clients because right now we're only focusing on that little bit. And so we're trying to expand our client base, and I think that's one of the ways we're trying to improve with making it grow. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and the one thing that was concerning to me is mm -hmm. that you definitely talked about how long and how much time you mm -hmm. spend with a customer. Yeah. And that's very you. That's your personality. Yes. It's ingrained in you. How do you begin to find other people that will be that as well and then mm -hmm. help you grow your business? So this, the CTP ambassador program, I just really got it to the nitty gritty, but I've actually been using one of my close friends. I've known her for about five years. She's really been helping me with the administrative side, talking to my clients for me, and she's able to give them that personality that I have, where people still feel like this is still getting done. Even though they're not talking to Crystal, they may be talking to my helper, and she's still able to get what they need at the end of the day. Yep. Yes, pretty much, so, yeah. Uh, first of all, let me just say, you have an extraordinary career in front of you. Thank I don't you. think there's any question about that, and that definitely deserves applause, because oh. you're a rock star. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Uh, you're a rock star, and you're going to do amazing things. I'm Thank looking you. forward to following. Um, my question is very similar to Deb's, though. I mm -hmm. mean, look, I'm a big fan of Tool. I once put hundreds and hundreds of yards in t of Tool in a dining room to turn it into a little castle for my daughter. Oh, wow. So, and I mean Congrats hundreds you of that. yards of pink Tool. Yes. We'll never do that again. Um, <laughs> so I love it, and I love the concept, and it's really fun. But mm -hmm. how do you compete with people who are manufacturing in China and selling them on Amazon? That is a really good question. And that is something that I myself am still figuring out. Because with, with me being small and one person show right now in Baltimore, uh, though I am reaching people that are in Kentucky and West Virginia and different things like that, people still will probably go to Target and buy the $12 tutu. But the thing that I'm pushing to people is that we are one of a kind. So you're not going to go to Target and buy this tutu and not see 20 other people in the exact same thing. Our, everything we do is made to order. Like on my table, I only have one outfit because it's no way for me to keep everything that I've made because they're getting shipped off. So everything is one of a kind. We strive in making sure that people understand that you're not paying for to you're not paying to look like sister sister in 2018. Like you're not paying to have a twin. You're paying to look like your individual personality, and that's the biggest thing we've been pushing for people. Thank you. Love it. I love y'all, man. Y'all look. All right. <laughs> yes. Likewise, Crystal, I think you answered those questions beautifully. Mm -hmm. I think you said your secret sauce is heart. Yes. And I do think that heart is contagious and that you will pass that on to your team mm -hmm. and that will be your asset. Thank you. My question is, how do you at $200 market this and get the type of reach that you need to help this really grow? So what we've been doing so far with our market reach on social media is we've been using the prime outfits that we see catch a lot of people's attention. So I know like with the long tutus, a lot of adults like those, but also with the really cute outfits that say the little girl's name and the little character, we use funds to push those um, posts on Facebook and Instagram. We don't do like all the other posts that we post. Um, so we strategically pick the outfits that one that, well, I feel confident about all my outfits, but some of them you just step back and be like, I did that. So the ones that I feel like it's something that's different and new, I push those out there and a lot of people, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to turn those likes into clients. And so what I'm doing now is when people comment and say, oh, I love that, or they tag someone's name, I'll send that person a message. So we go the extra step in making sure if you like our post, if you like our Facebook, we're talking to you to see how can we help you, regardless of the event, the situation, the age, no matter. Like we, we take that extra step to get in contact with people that potentially could be clients. Yep. Any further questions? Oh, yes. So right now our fabrics are coming from, oh. You can't hear me. Oh, her question was where do I get my fabric? So right now my fabric is coming from Joann's, um, but hopefully with the stock inventory we're looking to buy them in bulk. Um, right now, Joann's is our main source of the tool, and we use Jiffy shirts to get our T-shirts. Um, but I am in the process of looking for a wholesale tool um, seller so we don't have to pay as much for the tool as we would pay at Joann's. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, we're, so right now, what we have is keeping us afloat, but we're also looking to in, would decrease the money that we spend in buying the supplies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, judges. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Well, I said it before, but I'll say it again. What about these contestants, everyone? Right? I'm excited. We have two more. Our second to last uh, coming up next is Makita Thompson, who will be presenting The Party Room. A round of applause for Makita. The Party Room is a one-stop shop party planning service for anyone that's planning a special occasion such as a bar mitzvah, theme party, uh, theme party, recital, small concert. Hello everyone, my name is Makita Thompson and I am the CEO slash founder of The Party Room. I have been working in the entertainment industry over the past eight years, creating custom props and costumes 
for individuals and briefly as a, a venue provider. And I am here tonight to tell you about the absolute best party planning service money can buy that is deliverable to your home or any venue of your choosing. Has anyone here ever taken on the task of planning a party? <laughs> and more than likely, you can recognize this situation on my right. Standing in long retail lines just to pay high price for party supplies, or for my tech savvy bunch, searching through hundreds of vendors on bargain websites such as eBay or Amazon, just to end up disappointed when expectations fall short. In our mind, we all want that wow effect when we plan in a party, but some way or another, we end up with a situation like this. <laughs> yeah, pretty lame, that's your party. <laughs> and the reason why is because awesome party props and decorations are expensive. However, the party room is your number one solution. All you have to do is make the call. Our team of experts will show up to your doorstep ready to deliver you stress and ease by saving you time and money, and of course, designing your party better than you. There are alternatives that offer some, but not all of the options that the party room has to offer. Our research indicates that the party room is simply the smarter way to plan, saving you way more time and money while offering you way more accommodations. Here's how. The party room basic package accommodates 75 guests. For only $700, you get, for only $700, you get invitations, buffet, decorations, theme props, music, speakers, photo booth, party lights, fog, setup, and breakdown with every booking. We also offer subscription options for the for-profit industry professionals with calculated savings from $700 to $1,100 per year. So if you're an entertainment manager or a party promoter, who seeks to make a profit from your events, these packages are the way to go. Our total addressable market, our total addressable market range was calculated to, to our total addressable market range is estimated to calculate future revenue based off of recent experience to identify popular party planning days that are <clears throat> That customers such as, sorry about that, sorry everyone, um, that, customer, that costume and prop customers utilize that typically plan events two to six events per year. Entertainment managers and promoters who typically plan six to 12 events per year. And a slew of drop-in customers that I've interacted with as a result of my 2016 Craigslist and social media posts that reached out to me. Year one, our projected revenue is expected to reach $179,200 with a gross margin of 57%. Through investing, uh, sorry. through investing, we plan to increase our inventory and hire, and hire more party room setup techs. Year two, we plan to double our profits um, to $3,000. 300,500, dollars $308,400. The way we plan to utilize the funds from this admin pitch competition, $200 will be spent on 10 heated buffet trays, $260 for four LED bar counters, a total of $1,356 will go towards four special lighting units, two fog machines, two portable speakers and two pro speakers, two professional speaker devices. $1,000 will cover one, two thirds of the cost of the deposit for the photo booth. 
and the $184 remaining will go towards the first two deliveries for the zip car service. As you can see, the potential for this investment round will enable the party room to be cash flow positive by 2019. And that will bump us into the cash flow range. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone here tonight. And remember to contact the party room for your next event. If you want an event, you and your guests will never forget. Way to go, Makita. Judges, do we have questions for the party room delivered? Anyone? Tell us. How many different types of parties can you do? Because we, each one costs a lot of money when you do the different decorations. Okay, the way that we plan to tackle that problem is um, I have real estate, so it's like I plan to use that as storage for the themes. And what you're getting is a rentable service. So it's like you're not actually pack, um, purchasing the props as, as they are. You're just I'm renting them. You're renting them for a base price, so it don't matter what your theme is, whether it's a decades party, silhouette party, masquerade party, you're gonna pay the exact same price. Right. And then the food will be different or the same at every party? What we do is we actually provide resources for um, like vendors such as caterers and stuff like that, but the buffet setup does not actually include the food, but we will find you a caterer. So that's the whole point of like, when you contact us, you don't have to search for anything. We'll, we'll put you in contact with caterers to fit your budget. We'll put you in contact with, you know, if you need um, liquor distribution or stuff like that. But we mainly create the look of your party, the theme. Okay. Other questions, judges? So the $700, how, how do you determine what size event that's for? Is it up, up it's to 75? It accommodates up to 75 guests. And then the price scales from there. And then the price goes from there? Correct. Like if the event gets larger, because that means that um, more than likely, it, it really all depends on what you need, what you need because like if you're in an empty venue and you need tables and chairs and set up, that could be an additional cost. If you need custom costumes, that could be an additional cost, but the basic package pretty much covers your, your theme, which is the setup, your decorations, your um, buffet style, your bar stall for your liquor, but does not include the liquor. Your photo booth that you and your guests- Well, you had me when you had the liquor in there, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, really, my real question is about how do you scale it and how did you come up with that base package price? The way I came up with it is because I used to have a party room venue and um, for that venue, I charge only $500 basically for the same thing that you get in here. But everything that you, that's pretty much here was already there in the club. So um, people only paid $500. I took care of everything for them. And it was like, this is a really great idea. And it, it took off. So my question is, um, your actual customer, is this a B2B play? You're selling business to business. You want to provide your services to people who are in the event space? Or are you selling to me, the consumer, because I have my husband's you know, birthday coming up and I've got 35 people coming and I don't want to fool around with it. So which is it? I'm selling, um, I'm B2C and I'm B2B. Like for you, if you want your event in your home, we would come into your home, design your home um, to fit whatever type of theme party you like. I'm doing B2B for, um, for entertainment managers and party promoters. And then even when it comes to B2C, if you don't necessarily want it in your house, but you want like an intimate setting, like I'm, I'm actually planning to, you know, incorporate it with like an Airbnb. So where, so if you want to, you know, rent a spot like through Airbnb and you, we come there and we set it up, that's more like B2C. All right. Thank you, Makita. Thank you, judges. coming down to it. So finally, um, but last but not least, I'd like to welcome out Brittany Whitby and her teammate Demi, who will be presenting Charmony Natural Naturals. I'm sorry. Give a round of applause.
I'm Brittany Whitby, and this is Debbie Ebermitis, and we are Charmony Naturals. We've combined a mix of experiences in business, sales, and chemistry to create a hemp-based CBD cosmetics line of bath, body, and beauty products that combines the dynamic mix of hemp-based CBD and carefully selected natural botanicals. give people the benefits of hemp-derived CBD, which has a dynamic number of hemp ben uh, health benefits, and carefully chosen botanicals to maximize the effectiveness of the product purpose with made with purpose-driven formulas and to maximize your enjoyment. So many of you may be aware that CBD is one of the hottest and most controversial tw trends of uh, the wellness warrior in 2018. So what is CBD? CBD is derived from a hemp plant. It is non-psychoactive, and it is legal to produce in Maryland for consumer goods. CBD, derived from the hemp plant, contains the high CBD levels, but low THC levels. So in layman's terms, it doesn't get you high. <laughs> so why, why topical CBD, all right? Topical CBD has anti-inflammatory properties and natural analgesic properties. Basically, it helps with muscle recovery, joint inflammation, strains. It also promotes cell regeneration in cases like psoriasis. And last but not least, it feels good and you deserve it. <laughs> so what sets us apart from the competition, all right? We have some of our, our, our bigger producers here on the left, but the problem with them is they're big and they're cumbersome. All right? So they don't have the ability to quickly shift gears or offer um, limited edition products, but their, 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 their span is very diverse. However, they're very dispensary focused. Then you have some of our competitive producers here in the middle. They have a very limited product line, uh, and you can really only find them at cannabis-driven events or online, uh, like on Instagram. Uh, we at Charmany Naturals, we strive to be both. So with our small batch sizes, and our current manufacturing facility, we have the ability to have variety, seasonal products. We have a sales force to go out to stores to get us in. We have a current web store that launches this weekend for consumer sales. Uh, we have several events that we are currently looking forward to, uh, like the Natural Products Expo. Uh, several launch promotions that are currently pending. We have a charity partnership that should launch in 2019. We're hoping to partner with 98 Rock for that. At Charmony Naturals, we make natural products, white labeling, with love, passion, joy. It's kind of what we do. So my grandmother, like many other people, fell victim to a snake oil that claimed to be CBD-based on Amazon. Um, and unfortunately, after a lot of research, it, it really wasn't. So we plan to to provide people who are buying these kinds of snake oil fake products on Amazon with the real thing. So we're going to, we have made a hemp based, a hemp oil based lotion to sell on Amazon that goes direct to the consumer and they get a coupon to go directly to our website and get what they really think they're buying, what they really want. So a little bit about our customers before we get into who we're going to be selling to and who our target market is. So our customers are the moms who have back pain or, or joint pain and want a little bit of relief. It's our people who say that they have a poor complexion and they can't use any products that don't break them out and they, they're very scared to try new things and we've uh, broken a lot of ground with those people by creating formulas that are great for people with sensitive skin. Things that reduce redness, things that improve your complexion things that soften your skin, things that um, really just make you look and feel good. So moms are a big, uh, big one. People who are looking to feel and look good is another. Um, people introducing it to their parents. And lastly, blue collar workers have been a really uh, kind of a surprise market for us. My biggest customer for bath bombs are actually men. Um, people who work hard, they use their muscles all week long, and they like to relax at the end of the week. So we're really grateful for people who try it. And yeah, they've uh, converted from lush bath bombs to ours, so that's great. So how are we gonna reach these people? 
So we intend on targeting uh, businesses primarily to do the legwork of selling for us. So we're looking at health food stores, yoga and fitness centers for massage oils and things that they can use after workouts to relieve soreness in their muscles. We're looking at dispensaries on a state-by-state -state basis. A lot of this is meeting licensing requirements in some states. Others are allowed to import CBD products into their system, provided testing and labeling criteria are met. So we're exploring those options. Head shops is the classic place where people know that they can find CBD, and we've closed a few of those already. And lastly, small beauty brands. So we'll be working with um, the Messy Buddha to create the massage oil candles, and they're looking for us to white label products for their stores as well. Okay, so traction. Um, we have $2,000 a month in cash sales from people we know, word of mouth, and we're really grateful for those people. Uh, we have people who are picking up bath bombs, shampoos, conditioners, body washes, um, who rent uh, hair styling salons and barber shops and things like that, and they're picking up our products and selling them to accessorize their services that they offer. We are looking at hair salons who, like, um, what is it, Sprout is an organic salon here. There's also Crafted and Hamden, and they've expressed interest in us making products for them with custom scents and varieties, so we're talking to those people as well. Uh, we have direct-to-consumer sales with our web store popping up at the end of the week. We also are reaching out to the customer. We know that educating people about CBD is one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face. So the more face time that we get with these people who are going to try our products, the better. We are popping up a kiosk in Towson for their Maker Mart um, this Saturday. Come see us, please. And Saturday, the 1st of December. And actually, we just got the email to confirm that we definitely have closed a kiosk for White Marsh Mall from November 20th until January 1st. So we're looking forward to greeting everybody for their holiday shopping. Um, so, and the White Marsh Mall kiosk. We also have two private label negotiations going on. One of them I mentioned, which was the Messy Buddha. Uh, the other is we have partners that we've been working with over time in Michigan who have kind of helped fund this venture early on. And with the law just having changed with election day there, um, and CBD being legalized now. They're looking for us to create products and use our formulas for their brand revolutionary remedies up there too, which is great. And lastly, the web store, which again, will be done this weekend. So how are we gonna use the money? Um, we know we can crank out new formulas. Uh, we can make body washes that are also bug repellents for the summer. We can make gels that help heal your sunburn in the summer. We can make bath bombs that are warming in, in the winter, um, but we really, need packaging. So we've been lucky to self-fund this so far. Friends, family, and favors um, has been the whole thing. We fundraised on GoFundMe to get this far. But the one thing we can't do ourselves is really buy the packaging and get the graphic design that we need. So we're really hoping to use this prize to elevate our product to something that is going to look better on a shelf. Thank you so much. Judges. Questions? Mrs. Admin. Did you invent the oil, or you got it from somewhere else, or how did you put it together? So Maryland allows um, you to import hemp-derived CBD extracts uh, from other states. And how this all really got started was that I worked with a couple of friends who were growing hemp, and it was their startup in Colorado. They partnered uh, with a celebrity licensing, licensing deal, and I kind of helped work their booth when they were getting started. They have bought and sold their company twice now, but um, we're lucky to see their farms popping up in various states, so we're able to work with them to source our CBD extracts, and is, then we use them in our consumer goods. Is that like a massage oil, too, or not? So by, in and of itself, it is kind of like a purified, refined extract, so you don't want to use it alone, um, unless maybe it's in a supplement as like a whole plant extract, mm -hmm. which some people do internally. But um, in consumer goods, you want to add them to a carrier oil, yes, like a massage, a, jo a jojoba, or a coconut oil. So you oil. put that oil into the massage oil? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, just one. Of course. Other questions? Judges? Sure. So obviously your timing is very good on this. Um, have, have you talked to some of the dispensaries in Maryland about placing your product there? Yes, actually we've uh, been in talks with a few people who are managing dispensaries and people who have processing licenses um, to possibly share our formulas with them. Um, out of state, we have uh, people in Michigan who have a processing license there and that's how they're working with Revolutionary Remedies. So we're in talks with a few dispensaries both in the state and outside. So do the dispensaries, they don't necessarily source their products uh, exclusively. They can sell any product that that you know fits the description of cannabis related. So in dispensaries in Maryland, 
the way we have to solve with them is kind of, you know, you have to dance around the legal checkerboard that everybody is dealing with right now. So in the side the dispensaries, they're allowed to sell things from the psychoactive medicinal cannabis that's grown within the MMCC system here. But a lot of them, probably about half or more of them, are popping up wellness centers next door where they sell the accessories and everything that isn't specifically cannabis. So hemp-derived products that come from in or out of state, um, you know, your glassware, your vaporizer accessories are all being sold in the wellness centers next door, and that's how we're going to be able to work with them. So I want to tell you that I think your name is excellent, Hemp and Healthy. Mm -hmm. I would put that more prominently on your product. Absolutely. But this strikes me as sort of the new shea butter, right? Shea butter was the big thing, and I think this could be the next big wave. Yeah, we've been really excited by the feedback we've been getting from people who've tried our products, so I really hope you enjoy it. Thank I'm sorry you. if you went over this when you were introducing yourself, but what attracted you, both of you, to this particular um, line? I was never a, for a long time, and, like and, and there's a friend in the audience like who's, who's going to be, he's oh. going to be teasing me for, <laughs> for loving CBD so much now, because for a long time I was one of those people who thought it was snake oil, and um, I really had a really bad year last year, and it triggered some PTSD for me, and CBD and trying it through the friends who were growing it and really getting to try their stuff was what convinced me that it really worked. And um, trying it in topicals, making it for my mom. She has arthritis. Uh, my dad had knee replacement surgeries. Um, I started making it for friends and family and then getting more and more requests from people to kind of push my creativity for new products. And I really started using the body wash, the shampoos and conditioners, the bath bombs on a Friday or a Saturday night. And I really find that they increase my sense of well-being. So I'm a big believer in it. So that's super great that you guys are at 2,000 in monthly revenue. Yes, and we've I just, only been open four months, so. That's awesome. And I just want to get a sense of how you envision this unfolding. What do you, how do you project your revenue or what's your desired revenue over the next, you know, in year one, year two, and year three? Um, I mean, I, we'd like to sell as much as possible and reach as many people as possible. So I've never, I feel like I've never uh, put a firm number on it. Um, I think. Beyond just, just making revenue, I'm really excited about creating new formulas and finding all the different ways that we can make people happy with it. So uh, reach as far and as fast as possible. Uh, we, once we sell in the malls, we think that the gates will really be open and people will understand, especially here in Maryland, what it is that they can do with CBD. And uh, so after that, it'll be a race to get as much revenue as we can. One more quick question. You mentioned the snake oil a couple times. How do you help folks know that this is the real deal versus the other competitive products that are out there? So part of the way that you are legal to sell in Maryland is that your products are tested. So one, we know the farms that are growing. We know the strains that they're using. Our products come in tested. We get the ingredients second tested uh, a second time just to verify that you know there's no pesticides, even though we know that there's not going to be, that the potency is there, that the purity is there, everything. And uh, then the final batches are tested as well. And these are sample labels that we've been using while we got started up. So they're, they don't have a barcode, but all of our products will have a QR code that people can go online. They can see who made them. They can see the lab results for our products by the batch. So thanks. All right. What does it do? There are a number of benefits. So most people are familiar with the internal benefits of CBD, but topically it has anti-inflammatory effects, which contributes to the loosening of your joints, but also decreasing redness in your face. It's a mild analgesic, so it'll relieve a little bit of pain, which makes it great for sunburn and bug bites, and also just sore muscles. Um, it has anti-proliferative properties, and which means it affects cell regulation uh, of sebocytes, which produce oils. It also has been shown to affect um, the cell process that controls psoriasis, so there's a chance it might benefit people with dermatitis as well, and there's a lot of buzz about it being a really great acne treatment. So topically, it's a really interesting, interesting ingredient. Yeah. All right, thank you, judges, for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany and Demi. If you stay here, I'd like to invite the, uh, the other contestants out. for one. We're going to have one more round of applause. You get to see the contestants one more time. They bring them in. I don't know. I don't know about uh, these judges. I think they have their work cut out for you, but I think you all do as well. So make sure that you uh, you pick your your favorites. They're not there. All right. Well, bring. Come on out one more time, everyone. Give a round of applause for our contestants for tonight. Well deserved. All right. 
So that, that concludes the pitch present, presentation part of our evening. So I'd like to invite all of you to join us out in the atrium where we'll have food and coffee and water. We are a university. Uh, and and you'll, get, uh, you'll have a chance while the judges to deliberate, will do their deliberations to meet with each of these contestants, ask them questions that you might have. But thank you all for coming. And uh, stick around in about 20 minutes. Uh, we'll be awarding our three prizes for the evening. So this is uh, what you've been waiting for tonight. It's, uh, it's a chance to see who our winners were. Was it, a it was a difficult job, right? <laughs> it was an extremely difficult job. We could have been back there for a little longer, but we didn't want to hold everybody up. I'd like to have all of the participants please come up front. All everybody. Everybody here? Jonathan Harris, when I call you, come over here. First and foremost, I'm most appreciative to all of you that supported all everybody, and let's give them all one big round of applause. <laughs> Prior to giving out the prizes, um, we have a, something for each one of you to take with you. Uh, one is a book on the Atman family and what we all do and how we all participate in Baltimore and the metropolitan area. So, Jonathan and Harris, come on over and give everybody a book. There may be. Okay. I have one that's shy because I didn't know that there were seven of us that were participating in six, but I have another book that I have to go find it, so don't worry about it. You're not going to be held back. And we have for each one of you two tickets to a University of Maryland basketball game at College Park. There we go. So you can take your favorite friend, character, Lover. <laughs> okay. There's two. There should be two in each one. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. So everybody is a winner here at the University of Baltimore all the time. That's what we like, and I really appreciate the enthusiasm that everybody had, both in the audience and especially all our presenters. We're going to start off with, this is the crowd favorite that you all voted for. So all of you collectively made this choice, and we're glad to present this to Karima McClendon. All right, give her a big round. All right, very, very difficult choosing between second and first and first and second. Actually, if we had the ability, we'd like to make everybody first, and in our minds, everybody here that presented is first. So for the second upon the voting is Charmony Naturals. Phyllis, don't take any pictures until my wife comes. Okay. All right, there we go. Here, you guys um, stand over here. Where do you want? That's it. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. All right. All right, congratulations to you and great success. Last but not least, and first in a choice that was very, very much debated back in the room. It was getting hot. We had to open the doors. And so the choice turns out to be Prevail. Let's give her a big round of applause.
Fellas, step this way. Step this way, guys. Guys, step this way. All right, gotta go this way. All right. This way, that way. But th thanks everybody for coming. There's there's still some food left, and uh, there's still quite a bit of networking to do. So uh, thank you, and again, Mr. Atman, thank you very much. I, I also want to encourage. I also want to encourage all of you for additional ideas on how to make this particular presentation better and so that we can have much more participation from everyone that's around and encourage more of the students and those who are outside working very hard to participate with us. So we encourage all of you to write to the University of Baltimore and to our presentation committee better ideas we would like to hear from each and every one of you. Thank you all very much and thank you very much for coming.